What if I told you that Maxwell Chikambutso didn't just build a radio frequency powered car, but that he modified it so thoroughly it can now withstand an electromagnetic pulse attack? He begins his day standing in front of his modified vehicle, the hum of electronics around him faint but insistent. He touches the door handle and remarks that this car is no longer simply electric or RF powered, it is EMP hardened. The bodywork has been reinforced with conductive mesh and Faraday cage style shielding embedded beneath the paint and panels. Inside the vehicle sits a network of sensors tuned to detect sudden bursts of electromagnetic energy, pulses that would ordinarily fry microchips and electronics. When an EMP event occurs the sensors trigger a protective mode, internal power is diverted to ground loops, protective circuits engage, and the RF energy capture system shifts into a defensive state. He explains that his RF capture system not only powers the vehicle under normal conditions but in EMP mode it acts like a stabilizer, absorbing unwanted surges and redirecting harmful energy away from vital systems. The concept is audacious. The same circuits that harvest ambient radio frequency waves now serve as shields against electromagnetic attacks. While many dismiss his earlier free energy claims as unverified, fact-checkers have flagged them as lacking independent demonstration. AP News plus 2 PRV Engineering plus 2. He is undeterred. He describes his latest prototype's architecture, a dual-layer battery buffer, an RF harvester tuned from VHF to microwave bands, and a high-speed switch mode converter that doubles as a surge absorber. In normal mode the vehicle draws from the RF harvester for propulsion, reducing dependency on conventional battery packs. In EMP mode the system detects the pulse and immediately shifts the switching network to a bypass configuration, diverting dangerous voltage peaks into a sacrificial resistor bank and then into ground. He invested months into modeling the event in simulation, inputting parameters of high-altitude nuclear detonation EMPs, solar thermal flare bursts, and localized non-nuclear EMPs. He built prototypes of the shielding materials, layering aluminium copper mesh with carbon fiber substrate and connecting them to the vehicle chassis ground to create a Faraday effect around the cabin. Every electronic module in the car is housed within a mini Faraday cage, including the central computing unit, infotainment, navigation, RF harvester controller, and the motor inverter. He attaches a small RF antenna array to the roof and sides of the car. During regular driving it draws ambient radio waves. During an EMP event the same array turns into an early warning sensor. The firmware monitors the rate of change in electromagnetic fields. If it exceeds a threshold, the car's EMP defense, sequence triggers and closes relays to isolate critical systems from the external network. He further describes backup analog control paths. If digital systems fail despite shielding, a fallback hydraulic mechanical link will still allow decoupled vehicle steering and braking. In constructing this car, he also installed redundant power paths. The RF harvester feeds into a capacitor bank which charges slowly in regular driving and offers stored energy if the external grid collapses. During one demonstration he simulated a massive surge by using a high voltage generator near the vehicle in a secured area. The shielding held, the vehicle systems logged a spike but continued functioning with negligible disruption. He emphasizes the importance of every connection being low impedance, every enclosure bonded to chassis, and every external cable fitted with transient suppression and gas discharge tubes. He recounts the skepticism, engineers telling him that RF harvesting cannot supply propulsion, that EMP shielding at automotive scale is prohibitively heavy, that batteries remain the only viable path, yet he persists. He states the design philosophy, anticipate the worst scenario, build for durability, merge energy harvesting with protection so that the vehicle is both self-sustaining and resilient. He chooses to exploit the ambient RF, noise floor, as a resource, capturing scattered radio, TV broadcasts, cell tower emissions, Wi-Fi, even distant radar echoes. He says the harvesting isn't intended to rival megawatt-scale power, but to reduce reliance on external infrastructure and to provide a buffer during power disruptions or attacks. He acknowledges the limits. The harvester output is modest, the shielding adds weight and cost, the protection systems occupy space that could otherwise be used for cargo or passengers. He argues that in a scenario where a global EMP event disables vehicles, 
communications and infrastructure, his car would still allow mobility, safety, and autonomy. He paints a picture, first responders, executives, diplomats, or even civilians in uncertain regions could drive safely when others are stranded. He correlates his project to national security, Modern vehicles are increasingly electronic and vulnerable, an EMP event could turn fleets into incapacitated metal. By retrofitting RF capture plus EMP protection, he says we can leapfrog traditional defense paradigms and give individuals resilience. He shows wiring diagrams. The RF harvester connects through a diode bridge to charge capacitors. A MOSFET network under control of a microcontroller directs power either to propulsion or to divert external surges. The shielding is contiguous with the chassis, every window has conductive film strips, cables are shielded coaxial or braided, external ports have surge guards. He notes that when the system detects an EMP threat, it shuts off external data links, converts to island mode where only internal power flows, and engages mechanical disconnection of battery modules from the external charging network. He cites use cases, disaster zones, war zones, off-grid expeditions, areas vulnerable to solar storms, or even private individuals who worry about grid collapse. He claims the vehicle has a typical range of 300 kilometers using ambient RF harvesting plus stored buffer, and that in the EMP mode it sustained operation for hours after his surge test. He demonstrates a touchscreen readout, EMP mode active, shields engaged, external input isolated, ambient RF harvesting at 90% efficiency. He emphasizes maintenance, shielding integrity must be verified annually, the capacitance bank must be tested, firmware updated, mesh adhesives checked for corrosion. At a conference he showed videos, the car driving, then a simulated EMP event using pulse generator, lights flicker, audio shuts off momentarily, then systems recover and the car continues. He invites independent testing. External labs are welcome to verify shielding effectiveness, EMP survivability, RF harvesting levels, though he says some still decline citing prototype confidentiality. He is aware of criticism. Many physicists argue that harvesting ambient RF energy cannot fuel a car, that EMP shielding for consumer vehicles isn't standard, that cost slash weight trade-offs are steep. He counters that his design doesn't rely entirely on RF harvesting for propulsion, rather it uses RF to supplement, reduce conventional battery load, and integrate that with protective architecture. He emphasizes that the vehicle is not purely free energy, but hybrid. RF harvesting plus conventional batteries plus shielding plus EMP protection equals a new category. He describes the software, real-time monitoring of electromagnetic spectrum, event classification, solar, nuclear, lightning, local EMP device, automatic system reconfiguration, logging of event data. He speaks of collaboration with defense contractors, off-grid NGO planners, even private clients in remote regions, all interested in vehicles that survive when standard ones won't. He envisions a future where fleets of these EMP resilient RF harvest vehicles are deployed for critical infrastructure, communications, medical, emergency response, rural logistics. He acknowledges hurdles, certification, regulatory approval, insurance liability, standardization of shielding protocols, scalability of RF harvesting across varied geographies. He remains optimistic. With rising electromagnetic threats, solar storms, geomagnetic events, regional EMP weapons, vehicles built for resistance will gain strategic value. He concludes that his modified car is more than transportation. It's a rolling fortress, an energy microgrid, a mobile safe haven. He invites skeptics to test and challenge. He calls the architecture open to peer review, though full data remains under NDA due to commercial and security concerns. Finally, he reflects, this car was born from the question, what happens when the lights go out, when the grid fails, when the pulse hits? Do I sit and wait or do I drive through? He smiles, opens the door, and invites you to take a seat. Because when you press start, it's not just ignition, it's defiance. He closes the door, and the cabin instantly feels different. Sealed, insulated, almost impervious. The dashboard flickers to life showing readings from dozens of sensors monitoring voltage, electromagnetic flux, and RF input levels.
He points out the capacitive buffers lined beneath the floor, explaining how they smooth energy spikes and prevent damage to sensitive electronics. He turns to the RF harvester controller, a compact unit humming quietly, which now serves a dual purpose, energy collection and EMP mitigation. He elaborates that each module is networked redundantly, so if one fails during a surge, another instantly assumes control. He demonstrates by toggling a simulation mode. On the display, an artificial EMP pulse propagates, yet the vehicle's systems remain stable, lights dim momentarily but instantly recover. He emphasizes that the success lies in timing. Microsecond level detection triggers protective relays before the surge reaches critical circuits. He explains that the Faraday cage integration is not superficial, the mesh extends under panels, inside doors, even into seat frames, creating a continuous protective envelope. The windows are treated with conductive coatings that form part of the cage without obstructing visibility. He describes the testing phase. Hundreds of simulations, lab pulses, field tests, all designed to measure system resilience and reliability. He notes that in one trial, a Tesla coil generated a pulse equivalent to several kilovolts per meter, and the vehicle emerged fully operational, logging only transient anomalies. He reveals that some components were custom-built, surge-proof inverters, hardened microcontrollers, and reinforced communication links to survive unexpected spikes. He smiles as he shows the analog backup controls, mechanical linkages that allow steering and braking even if all digital systems fail. He highlights the ingenuity of merging RF harvesting with EMP defense. Two seemingly separate technologies now complement each other seamlessly. He explains that during normal driving, the car quickly absorbs ambient RF energy, trickle charging capacitors that buffer power for propulsion. When an EMP pulse is detected, the system instantly switches configuration, power is rerouted, shielding is optimized, and critical modules are isolated. He adds that the vehicle monitors for lingering aftereffects, such as induced currents in exposed wiring, and neutralizes them before they can cause damage. He points out that this dual-purpose system allows it to function in remote or hostile environments without relying on conventional infrastructure. He says that in regions prone to electrical instability, the car could continue operation while conventional vehicles fail entirely. He emphasizes the strategic value. Emergency response teams, journalists, humanitarian workers, and even private owners can maintain mobility during critical events. He discusses power management. Even if RF harvesting only generates small amounts, the system prioritizes life-sustaining functions first, then propulsion, then non-essential electronics. He demonstrates the telemetry system. All EMP events are logged in detail for analysis, helping improve future designs and refine protection algorithms. He explains that the vehicle's firmware is designed for continuous adaptation, learning from each surge event to optimize shielding and rerouting protocols. He shows how external RF pulses are sensed at multiple points on the chassis to triangulate source direction, allowing preemptive protective measures. He reflects on the challenges, balancing shielding effectiveness with weight, preserving performance while embedding protective meshes, and maintaining user comfort. He acknowledges that critics remain skeptical, but he urges that the empirical tests speak louder than theoretical debates. He concludes with a vision, fleets of vehicles resilient to EMP and powered by ambient RF could redefine mobility, emergency response, and energy independence. He leans back, eyes gleaming, and says, this is more than a car. It's a blueprint for the future of resilient transportation. He starts the ignition. A low hum fills the cabin, a sign that energy is flowing, systems are online, and protection is active. He steps on the accelerator gently, the car gliding forward, demonstrating that performance is uncompromised despite all the protective measures. He notes that every curve, every acceleration, is monitored to ensure the shielding and electronics function seamlessly together. He stops momentarily to show the dashboard, energy harvesting is at peak efficiency, the shielding is fully engaged, and the vehicle reports zero anomalies. He smiles, remarking that the true test is not speed, but survival, reliability, and independence from fragile grids. He concludes, in a world where a single pulse could disable nations, this car ensures you are never helpless.
the RF-powered, EMP-protected vehicle glides silently down the testing track, a living testament to innovation, resilience, and visionary engineering.